AI yeah, doing all the jobs, nothing left to do in AI. There's no research problem in NLP. Uh, we are NLP is almost done. We have AGI. Don't believe in those. There are a lot of things to work on. There's a lot of areas. This doesn't mean you should totally do something dif- apart from the hype, but you should try to first find, find the right thing, right area where you want to work in. And then maybe try to align it with the current trend or what's happening in it. Or try those things on your stuff. But don't be just saying, okay, this is everybody doing. So let me also do that. So I, 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 especially I don't feel like that's the right way of uh, doing research. The research should be motivated by the problem and the need. And then the tools, techniques and the hype can come a bit in that thing as you need. Uh, one uh, senior professor once told me like, if you have a very hard problem as a mentor, which you cannot solve, give it to someone who is very fresh and new in the field. Maybe they will come with something crazy and it may solve the problem. And this is how many of the problems which are like 25 years, 50 years down the lane are solved by if you look at like they were never expected to be solved. But then someone who's new and fresh to the area just entered it and give a different perspective and solved it. So we was in Samsung Research Institute in Bangalore. So there actually we were working on some biometric problem and Samsung was releasing their wearable devices. Uh, which is very common nowadays, like the smartwatches and all, but Samsung was introducing those in the market. So there are a lot of problems in industries and now there are also a lot of tools and techniques where uh, ML, everybody wants to use it in some way or another. So I feel like what, how to read a paper, how to analyze a paper, how to develop the idea, how do you execute the idea? How do you check a proof of concept of the idea? How do you do rigorous research kind of aspect? So that's also another way if, if it's possible because not everybody I feel like can get an internship at like place and or even if the internship will give you a data science work or not any e-commerce site they basically have a seller which give you information about the product and now the point is where do you place that product in their website so that's the big question now this is a very hard problem because the number of labels which are there in this the number of categories in e-commerce can be very huge secondly the categories are not simple linear like they can be multiple categories in the form of a tree the tree is very big and you have millions of products and also it's depend on the people who you work with. So sometimes the project may be not that interesting, but the people you work with, they suggest you some good ideas. You have good interactions. You have a different way of thinking about it. They should know the topic quite well, or at least the problem really well. Even if we solve it or not, that doesn't matter. But they should know, okay, why we are solving it, what we are solving, you know, what are the approaches to solve it. So this should be very, very clear in your and their head. And this should be documented well. So I feel like that's also really helping. You should learn perseverance. Your things won't work in the first group. Secondly, you need to find ways of motivating yourself. Uh, you have to learn with dealing with rejection. So, and then also like be creative in, in your thoughts because you're doing research. So you need to think out of the box. Just don't rely on your advisor. Okay, every time he will come with the idea or he will think. You think also yourself what you can do. Some things you will learn by experience. For example, writing of papers. Uh, you will make a lot of mistakes, so don't be afraid of re- re- redoing things. Like, And then there is most cases, the PhD start with something like a loose idea because it is research. It's not like something well thought or it just need to be developed. And for that, I have to advise, like if you are this, always work on two projects at a time. So you'll make progress in one or other uh, or the other project. At least maybe first two years will be not as like the results. You will be working, but the result will not come immediately. So don't think of always the results matter. The progress which matters. If you take this attitude, the easier it will be to get the PhD. I'm telling you, like if you take the other attitude, okay, I need results, then it be, can become very hard because results is not in your control. And the progress and the effort is in your control, which you should continuously. Hello, students. I am sure that uh, all of you are already familiar with ChatGPT, right? One of the most intriguing AI inventions today, which is capable of uh, responding to almost all of your queries in a conversational friendlier manner, isn't it so? You may have also encountered Amazon Alexa, a smart assistant that can carry out your requests or Google Translate, which allows you to seamlessly translate text into several other languages. For example, the subtitles below you are seeing has been translated using Google Translate only. So these are just few examples of the numerous applications of natural language processing, a special branch of AI also known as NLP. You can call this as NLP. So today we have Dr. Vivek Gupta, a prominent NLP researcher as our guest speaker. He will be sharing his expertise with us and answering many questions we have on this fascinating branch. 
and most importantly this session will provide you with valuable insight on how to pursue a successful career in NLP research. So without any further delay, let us begin our today's session. So Vivek, first of all, I would like to thank you for joining us. We will certainly have a comprehensive conversation about your research on natural language processing. However, before we do that, uh, could you uh, share with us some details about your personal journey towards uh, becoming an NLP researcher? So starting from your undergraduate days, how did you uh, find and apply for your research internships and externships? And uh, what advice would you give to students who are interested in uh, pursuing similar opportunities? Uh, thanks for, first Ian, for inviting me for this interview and I'm hopeful that this would be helpful for many students and your viewers. So thanks for inviting. Um, yeah, coming to my uh, uh, NLP journey around. So I did my undergrad at IIT Kanpur. Uh, from, uh, so I was in a computer science department uh, in, as an undergrad bachelor student uh, where I was enrolled in Bachelor of Technology, which is equivalent to Bachelor of Science in US. So I was there from 2011 and by the end of like 2013 and 14, like roughly I have uh, interest in kind of machine learning. So this all started with kind of some of the courses I did at the undergrad and that time machine learning was picking up course and there was uh, like course and uh, importance because there was also a lot of Coursera courses around it. So I remember like the first course which I referred to in machine learning was on uh, I think it was on Coursera or something on machine learning, like uh, supervised machine learning, something like that. So from that, I got a bit of interest in uh, like machine learning and all. <laughs> and some of these interests actually developed through, as you said, about internship and externships. So I remember like the first internship where I actually started using machine learning was in Samsung Research Institute in Bangalore. So there actually we were working on some biometric problem and Samsung was releasing their wearable devices. Uh, which is very common nowadays, like the smartwatches and all, but Samsung was introducing those in the market. So there I got a little bit introduction of machine learning. Uh, it was like a very domain specific because this was like biology oriented stuff. And there basically in that internship, I started ramping up on my machine learning skill by online courses and all. And um, that, that work went well also. And that was my first kind of, you could say, introduction, basic introduction to machine learning. I won't say start with advanced courses, but you can even start with early on with ML or NLP courses. And that basically helped me uh, in getting frame on the machine learning and all. And then after that, basically, my second internship was with Flipkart, which will become my master thesis finally, probably like with a collaboration with them on like they want to say so e-commerce has a lot of uh, like cash seller data and they want to do some categorization, all that. And this, I would say, was the first research a uh, big research project for me on machine learning, which ultimately become my first paper and my thesis project. And that was also my, I think, one major introduction to NLP that time. So I was pretty much interested in doing natural language processing, which is a part of the AI. So AI is covered in multiple things like ML, NLP. So there, uh, the Flipkart thing was, I think, one of the turning point uh, around where I really, really got interested. Okay, I will do this as my career. Yeah, and I think it's exciting time to do these things also. And like, so there are a lot of problems in industries, and now there are also a lot of tools and techniques where uh, ML everybody wants to use it in some way or another. So I feel like internship, externship is one good opportunity to start. Uh, good courses is another opportunity you can start with. Like I think doing that before even an internship externship is helpful. Working with a somewhat a kind of a mentor who knows the field well, even better than the advisor in some way, uh, because he's working on that exact area and very specific domain. That could be a very good start to get interested in, especially if you want to do a research in NLP or ML, like what the problem is, how to approach a problem and what, how to read a paper, how to analyze a paper, how to develop the idea, how do you execute the idea, how do you check a proof of concept of the idea, how do you do rigorous research kind of aspect. So that's also another way if, if it's possible, because not everybody I feel like can get an internship at like place and uh, even if the internship will give you a data science work or not. But that's also another way uh, where you can get engaged and start this thing. And there is not harm anything because even if you Maybe it doesn't end into a very successful paper or like a end product, but still like you get some experience of learning with from a 
expert in the field and like okay so can you describe a specific research project or experiment you worked on as an intern or extern that you found particularly impactful or interesting okay i will go with someone which i did with flipkart which was the first project i think a major project which was interesting for me so that project was basically about categorization of uh, uh, like any e-commerce site they basically have a seller which give you information about the product and now the point is where do you place that product in their website so that's the big question and generally like this is done either that time now there are algorithms also but like my manually by people or the based on the seller insights about the catalog of the product uh, of the e-commerce site so but exactly where to place it and which tree level you have to place it so you have to decide on that now this is a very hard problem because the number of labels which are there in this well, the number of categories in e-commerce can be very huge secondly the categories are not simple linear like they can be multiple categories in the form of a tree so you can have a accessory computer then you can have computer accessories they all come under electronics so they can be multiple levels up to that six so it's kind of a big tree and then you also have to follow some constraints like if you place something in the bottom then it should satisfy all the categories to the top root level so <coughs> satisfying those constraints is also hard so and doing that in efficiently that's another problem because you, the tree is very big and you have millions of products so how do you do that efficiently so this was one of the problem which was i really like like web scale categorization of e-commerce products so this was my first internship project and then i realized this is much beyond an internship and it can be a basically a thesis project for a master student or something so i think this was one of good project uh, which i really enjoyed working on and also it's depend on the people who you work with so sometimes the project may be not that interesting but the people you work with they suggest some good ideas you have good interactions you have different way of thinking about it so it's also depend on that but uh, I, i remember my mentor there was pretty good he has so this this actually helped me out in those project i think that was i think one of the i one of the project which i really really enjoyed and then recently i did work with bloomberg a lot on several projects and one of the project which i worked was on basically tables based reasoning so how can you use table based reasoning for temporal questions so a hard questions or very numerical specific questions so how do you solve that thing how do you scale up that thing so those was also very interesting which is the ongoing work with them right now so this was two things i think which was pretty i i like the project among many of the projects which i did with industry uh, among these two like these two projects are pretty good at that yeah so i see that you have worked uh, both as a mentee and as a mentors i mean i think you are still now guiding lots of students being as a mentor so how do you approach mentorship and guidance in a research setting and uh, what are the strategies you found to be quite effective for building a strong relationships with your mentors and peers okay so yeah uh, i have been a phd student and a postdoc i am which i'm going next is Uh, this is interesting aspect of being in both places so you are not a faculty plus but you have great knowledge about the field so one thing i definitely feel uh, when you especially when i work as a <coughs> mentor for students uh, like uh, so you should have clear aim of what do you want for from them like for example one aim is you want them to impart in impart your knowledge to them so they should be more knowledgeable by the end of the project they should know the topic quite well or at least the problem really well even if we solve it or not that doesn't matter but they should know okay why we are solving it what we are solving you know what are the approaches to solve it and what we have tried out and why it work and why it did not work so these questions if you are able to answer well in the end of internships <laughs> so that's something i feel like you should aim for uh the ment uh the mentee to be able to do all this thing. and this also i feel the strong work ethics like uh which i also feel is important which i also learn from my phd advisors and other mentors during my whole time is you need to properly frame out the problems you should be active by yourself uh you should have proper uh, documentation of the me- uh, meeting minutes which you are doing what you are going to do so this should be very very clear in your and their head and this should be documented well so i feel like that's also really help and uh, being a mentee myself so uh, i as the things which i'm implementing is the same thing i learned from my advisors uh, so being a mentee you should learn perseverance your things won't work in the first go secondly you need to find ways of motivating yourself 
uh, you have to learn with dealing with rejection. So papers don't get accepted in one go. They may accept it two, three. And then also like be creative in, in your thoughts because you are doing research. So you need to think out of the box. Just don't rely on your advisor. Okay. Every time he will come with the idea or he will think. You think also yourself what you can do. Because ultimately you want to be an independent researcher. Ultimately you should be able to, there should be a problem which you should be able to identify. You should know what the existing techniques and where they are limited. And you should be able to frame that well. And then you should provide a solution which partially or uh, fully solve that problem to some extent. And then you have to make sure that the solution is feasible and useful for others in the community, both in the research and the uh, product side. Some things you will learn by experience, for example, writing of papers, uh, you will make a lot of mistakes, so don't be afraid of re re redoing things. Like I've written some, I have reformed some slides 10 times. I've also recorded some of my presentation 10 times. So it's ultimately your last version which goes to the community, not the first one to nine version. But you have to do that one to nine version to get to the 10th version. So don't be afraid of doing those hard work required in the back end, which will never get published. But like the 10th version will be the one which is seen. And that's where, where, like you say, okay, oh, wow, this guy has done a really good job. But then there's nine version which are behind that uh, final doc or nine version behind that final PPT or nine version behind that final uh, video or documentation, which is there. Uh, one uh, senior professor once told me like, if you have a very hard problem as a mentor, which you cannot solve, give it to someone who is very fresh and new in the field. Maybe they will come with something crazy and it may solve the problem. And this is how many of the problems which are like 25 years, 50 years down the lane are solved by if you look at like they were never expected to be solved. But then someone who is new and fresh to the area just entered it and give a different perspective and solve it. So be giving challenge problem to new students is not a bad idea as a mentor also and mentee should be also okay with taking harder problems and working in ultimately the thing you should be okay with is you have learned something by the end of the project that if that is happening then you should be satisfied outcomes like paper results and all they matter but like not at that level ultimately if you do something good you will have some outcome which is useful well as we all know that uh, phd is uh, lots of challenges and obstacles you have to face so uh, could you please share that what are some challenges you have also encountered and how did you overcome them okay so yeah, this is a very nice question, I think, and it would be very useful for especially people who are thinking about joining a PhD. So, so one, I will maybe divide this in two part. One is more of the professional friend life and secondly, on the personal aspect of life. So PhD, first thing everybody should think about is a very long term commitment, especially if you are doing in countries like India or US where it takes five years. In Europe, it's a bit, a little bit lesser and it's like three years. So it's still, and, but it's very project oriented. So, so you should be okay with five years working as a PhD, like research. And <laughs> so you should be very clear on kind of why you want to do it and what's your ultimate goal is. And these things changes. I want to say like if you, so for example, I, I also was not sure of what I will do after PhD or I will, I was a bit, little bit more confident because I did work as a research before that I want to be faculty. And I want to ultimately join some in the academy in US or India. But it's also fine to do a PhD, but you should have some very strong motivation around why you are wanted to do a PhD and what's your thing is. So, it's, and also you should be okay with if things didn't work out, like in the end of second, third years to leave the PhD. Don't think, okay, I invested already this much time. So then I should finish it. Like, don't be pressured on that. Also, I feel like that if you have these two things in mind, like, a bit of more idea on why you are doing some PhD and in which area and why you want to do in this. So two questions you should be very clear on a bit in the beginning. And secondly, you should also be very comfortable on like, okay, if didn't, things didn't work or then they can be multiple reasons. So the challenges will be a lot. So for example, like <coughs> many people who enter a PhD generally, they really don't know what they want to work on and their advisor sometimes know exactly know what to work on. Then that's the person like other kind of issues because then you will be possibly like working on things which your advisor decided on. And like, if you like it, it's very good. It can really work magic for you. But if you don't like it and he really wanted to work on that, then it's a very bad fit. So think about that. And then there is most cases, the PhD start with something like a loose idea because it is research. It's not like something well thought or it's just need to be developed. So you have some idea around you and your advisor have to work on, but it's not 
they are developed so you have to develop it and that can be a little bit uh, take time because there is always a learning curve to anything and that learning curve is always slower so most of the learning thing is exponential kind of function so it start very slow but it's then pick up very well so most of you see the phd's are more active in the last few years but their first paper came in later years so there's a learning curve so be okay with like having a patient for like getting your first papers in like it's not like you get paper in 3 months or 7 months which anyway you don't get i feel like good papers so it take time first of all you should be okay with that secondly <clears throat> there will be things like you work on something you were stuck in bottlenecks uh, and and you are stuck for maybe months two months sometimes even a semester so you should be okay with that and for that i have to advise like if you are this always work on two projects at a time so you will make progress in one or other uh, or the other project at least so that's a good advice to have no i won't say more than two at max 3 but don't go beyond 3 for sure like two three projects so that if one gets stuck or one didn't have progress for multiple reasons which happened to me also during my phd so then you can focus your attention on second project and meanwhile that is going good then suddenly the other project start working on and then so i did like this for many of my papers <coughs> projects basically i work on two problems at the same time where i was primarily doing the task and there i basically and if both are working you should be able to manage like 50 50% time on both of them and push it around so never stick to only one aspect of a phd like one projects or something because that's can be too risky and you should be also okay with things uh, not working out in the end like you work on something something and there can be multiple reason like it gets scooped now it's not relevant in the current field for example you are building a state of art model but now the state of art has changed to another level and you cannot have that then maybe you are working on some ideas like this happened to me a lot of time that the idea got scooped somebody did it before you you should be okay with that and i feel it's happy at least okay, okay what i was thinking is somebody important think important and actually did it so i was on the right track at least get happy about that so these are things and then overall i feel like take patience like it will take you time to adjust with a professor with your advisor it will take time to get your first paper it will get time to <coughs> get to your area or things like for example up till third year i even don't know what my area will be like i will working on tables but think about this exponential thing so in the last few years will be very productive but it will have a learning curve and it will take time to decide on like what areas uh, what my first paper look like my second what my thesis topic will be and then what <coughs> ultimately i will do in those things so be okay with that spending 5 6 years and maybe first two years will be not as like the results you will be working but the result will not come immediately so don't think of always the results matter the progress which matter if you take this attitude the easier it will be to get the phd i'm telling you like if you take the other attitude to okay, i need results then it be, can become very hard because results is not in your control and the progress and the effort is in your control which you should continuously put that's one thing and then also i feel like don't work on over hype topics uh, or trendy topics which i feel is a bit which weird and many people couldn't do it because they always get distracted by trends and trends come and go but you should think of area which you really like and where you think you can make a impact <coughs> you will be able to if you really like and you discover that area you will go in extra mile or extra hours and extra efforts to get things done so i feel like that's also something so do doesn't let your advisor always dictate you the area you should also have your say in area and develop it along with your advisor so that really helped me grow so this is on the professional side secondly is on personal side so like you should have some kind of work life balance it sound weird but i feel like there will be time when despite having two three projects nothing will work so you should always have some other distractions in your life this can be maybe uh, one uh, interesting distraction i feel you should definitely have is by doing some physical activity this help you clear your mind clear your thought and basically take you in a different zone which really help you and there's then is like if you have a better body you have better mind like this they are all connected like you should have definitely life beyond phd and apart from it and think of this also helping you as a uh personal aspect in doing the phd really really well so have that aspect also because it's a long journey so it's not a sprint it's a marathon 
and for marathon you need to develop the endurance and everything you need to run for a longer time you need a lot of training to do so phd is a training that's what also i want to say like wh- what you ultimately do matters but ultimately what you learn that is what matters not what you output but what you learn during that time so think of this as a marathon not as a sprint and then you will enjoy that so learning is always harder so but you have to put that effort and hard work around it so don't be afraid on that so could you please share some of your research little bit non technical is still fine okay fine so i will try to make it abstract so that other people can get it not just nlp or ai folks so my most of the work which i did during my phd which is also my latest work is dealing with uh, especially data in the web which is in tabular form so they are we are called technically semi structured form so these are data which are different form for example like you have raw text like sentences paragraph so they have basically a lot of conjunctions lot of preposition lot of articles and various form of grammars and syntax associated with them and then this is also different from very structured and human created form for example like knowledge graphs where there are in nodes and then there's a graph and there's a relation between them or even something like a database kind of thing where there is a very clean structure around it so what i do work on is like semi structured data which is tabular data for example of such data is like entity centric tables for example wikipedia tables or papers in uh, like scientific papers uh, tables in financial documents sorry and tables in medical domain so all these like t- tabular form of data so they have some structure and they are compact and they hold a lot of information in a certain form so they have a lot of information in very compact form and then for solving these things you may require a lot of tools and techniques then how do you adapt models <laughs> this thing and then there's also common problems of these models doing the correct prediction but for many wrong reasons so how do you deal with those aspects so there's a lot of things around this and these tables can be hierarchical uh, so they can be more complex so dealing with inference and reasonings aspect on these like for example question answering or sh- stating some claim is true or false given that table so these are the things which i worked on in my phd where i tried to build basically tools techniques resources platforms around working with semi structured data especially entity centric tables like info boxes and using them basically to solve real world problems in finance and as medical e-commerce domains so this was my phd all around so natural language process is uh, no doubt uh, an exciting branch of artificial intelligence so uh, what are some i mean in your opinion what are some of the most promising applications of nlp in areas like healthcare education and finance and how do you see these applications evolving in the future So yeah there is a lot of recent developments in NLP and I think most people are aware of chat gpt and zero shot approaches uh prompting and all like I think uh with the uh, making these tools publicly available at such a large scale as make even non NLP people and general public aware of these uh, NLP and AI and it rapid feel so I feel like <laughs> there's a lot to do yet it's not done uh, but there is very interesting application so now at least there are some areas we have made very very good progress for example we can generate really good sentences and these sentences but <laughs> issue we should be careful on also like are they grounded um so for example if we are generating sentences are they faithful or they are trustworthy they are not biased in way so these are the things i feel like we should be careful with the generative model which is interesting area like this gpt and dialogue based system coming to the application side especially the to- topics which you are thinking about like education healthcare and finance i see there's a lot of applications where it can be used but we should be also careful on basis of the type of application for example healthcare <laughs> important aspect is okay you can use a lot of nlp techniques for doing like for example uh, one interesting problem which i am looking with is for example you want a medical records which are evol- evolving over time like a patient history and now can you basically reason and summarize that history based which can be even in tabular form like you have reports and then you have image also associated with it like pathological reports and doctor report and then all those things so these <coughs> are records and these records can be summarized or analyzed and like can be used and then they can be also used now with medical knowledge which is published around the world to basically detect and uh, suggest things to doctor in a fast way for example 
this was a very good application and although it's not happened like radiologist is still there a job but it was shown that AI can really help make the things some of these faster but humans should be there in the loop because this is very sensitive things you cannot be wrong in those things so and then the wrong things like you can have a false uh, positive but you cannot have a false uh, uh, negative example so you need to be careful if somebody has a disease and if the model miss it then it's a big thing but if somebody doesn't have a disease and the model say it can have a disease then still fine because then there is further more checks around it to verify if there's a disease or not another aspect is also privacy around things so these are very personal domain for example healthcare specifically you don't want your uh, health report should be out to public or somebody in the language models have those reports and like is able to adversely get those reports from the language model so these data are private and these are like very one on one communication with you and your doctor or your personal health expert so how can that be used data with the power of ai without revealing anything to the general public or adversaries so that's another good application i feel which can be interesting in healthcare so how do you work privacy based nlp in those so and then also like how do you use with high precision because these are all especially healthcare like you need high precision aspect you and the errors are not equal as i said on things so you should be careful on reading those aspects of ai predictions and because that's needed because even a doctor want to know like why you predicted this and like he can then use his knowledge to verify if the claim made by ear or the reasoning or explanation behind a prediction is right or wrong so i think explainability for example privacy thing so healthcare i think these are the interesting problem coming to education i feel ai has a very good aspects because and education is now distributed all around the world and ai can really start pulling those things interesting thing for example khan academy is re- integrating like for example chatbot based feature so you can have a personalized ai tutor but then there should be also safety check that it should not teach something wrong uh, it should not uh, like could be used so education it can be used in a very weird way like people are using it for cheating on their assignment that's bad way of using education like you should not it should be having some moral ethics because as a student or as a child who is educating you don't want like as a parents also you don't or teacher you don't want to learn something bad so those should be checks around and there should be control or supervision of the parent or the teacher around those tools like what the student is learning the history need to be stored so what examples the student went through so, and then you have to build checks in those for sure because they should not be morally wrong and first of all and then they should be even on the subject matter they should not be uh, ro- they should be robust they should not do mistakes and help uh, do the wrong thing and if it do then they should be under supervision to be fixed faster so that it doesn't lead to cascading negative effect like precarious effect so and then finance i feel it has a lot of applications but finance do involve money so that's a very important factors around and then <coughs> recently for example like a, like a bloomberg i work a lot and they have released a gpt which is a finance version of generative ai and uh, it can be used in multiple ways for doing qa nli and all but then again this is a risky uh, thing and there the most important aspect is high precision because you will invest or you will make your financial decision on based on the output of the ai so how do you basically ensure that the model is high precise precise so in that case i feel the most interesting thing would be logical constraints so you may have ai output and even maybe having it some way explain the output but you can even constrain it to not do the obviously wrong things or in and this constraint can go in the learning phase or in the post prediction phase or other ways so this is like a neuro symbolic integration which can basically constrain the model output so that you can have a output which is of high precision because these are the things where you cannot sacrifice on precision because if you do that then the decision can have cascading effects so like wrong investments uh, wrong aspects so these things and again in this case i think a supervision of human should be there on the top layer issue of bias and fairness how do you ensure that the tool work really well for all kind of inputs in a fair and equitable fashion so that's also one thing on top of this ai safety net or human aligned ai also cover all okay thank you so we are in the verge of our ending of our session so i have only one final question which i usually ask to all of my guests that uh, what advice what piece of important advice would you like to give to students 
who are just starting their research or they are planning to enter for an internship um, yeah so i have bunch of advice i am not thought thoroughly on these advice but like i just few things which i came to my mind at the moment it's by the way this is a very nice question actually um so one advice is like um, you should think more on the problem rather than the solution because if you get the right problem and the right need for that problem like then i think solution will come eventually you may develop a partial solution or full solution and maybe a best solution or be partially okay solution but getting to the right problem is one of the most important thing i feel in a research but if you are starting on this what problem you are working think thoroughly about it what are the need of this problem do people care about this problem and this can even let you <coughs> enough motivation for solving that problem that's one advice second advice i would give is like okay trends are good so and there are a lot of predictions made on these trends especially these days there are a lot of influential material in the web about e AI taking over, AI doing all the jobs, nothing left to do in AI. There's no research problem in NLP. Uh, we are NLP is almost done. We have AGI. Don't believe in those. There are a lot of things to work on. There's a lot of areas. This doesn't mean you should totally do something dif- apart from the hype, but you should try to find find the right thing, right area where you want to work, with. and then maybe try to align it with the current trend or what's happening in there, or try those things on your stuff. but don't be just saying okay this is everybody doing so let me also do that so i i i especially i don't feel like that's the right way of uh, doing research the research should be motivated by the problem and the need and then the tools techniques and the hype can come a bit in that thing has you need but don't really pivot everything around because there's a hype going on something because hypes are hypes like they come and go like and they may be something which stay for a longer but if it stays going longer there will be tools and technology and you it will be definitely part of your phd and your aspect so don't be worried around it ki okay this is there and there will be i'm pretty sure some of people in current today scenario feel like okay these large models which they can even not train or even try on are doing really great on their task but there is need for everything like not everybody can run those models those models have their issues their models need to be improved there is a lot of issues in these models so there are a lot of problems around it it's not like it's fully solved or there is thing so you can align your work around it but that doesn't mean like you should just follow the hype third thing i feel is always uh, which i at least feel is helpful and lots of phd don't do is always look back after like 6 month uh, or one semester think about what you are working on like take a week off and just think of what you are doing why you are doing why it makes sense what you did last term how does it feel well and try to form a story around it like why do you think it's important this can really help you and write it down i am 100 100% like do write your thoughts and this thing because this can help you clear things once you start writing what's going on in your aspects and <clears throat> what's there if you can do this and then obviously interact with a lot of good people there are a lot of good people who are happy to advise mentors so don't be afraid of asking for help many people don't do that they're too shy or introvert to do that plus please but but don't do that i feel like if you do the other way you will probably do much 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 better in phd so be don't be too afraid to take help in needed and this can be help in kind of like professional aspects of skills and also in personal aspects and trends come and go problem statement go and go even fields come and go but the learning which you did and the <coughs> expertise you acquire doing that that can be transferred to any new things which you work on so it's not like five fear if you spend on something and you didn't do like it's not a waste it's always learning okay thank you vivek we wish you all the best for your future endeavors and have a nice day thanks for inviting and i hope this was it will be helpful for some of the people especially the one who are like really impacted by recent trends in nlp and ai so hope they will help it and like if they have if any of your viewers have any other questions they can reach me out on my email address it's on my website or it's just my reverse of my first name 9@gmail.com they can reach out to me and ask anything i will be happy to help as much i think this will help a lot of people thank you and thanks for inviting